All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is May Shocheo, the APSA Executive Director. So today I would like to welcome you to the last session of APSA Virtual Technical Session. So this session is hosted by Special Interest Group on Vegetables and Ornamentals. So before we start the agenda today of the session, I would like to give you uh, just quick housekeeping group. Uh, so everyone, when you join here in the in the webinar, you are on mute automatically and you are not allowed to turn on your camera. So during the presentation, you are allowed to put the questions in the Q&A box. So make sure you can find Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. So once you put the question in the Q&A box, that's allow our chair and also our speakers to see your questions. And so they can address after their presentation. So for any technical issues, you may put your comments in the chat box. All right. So I think it's clear to everyone. So before we start the agenda, I would like to thank our sponsor, HM Class, who uh, sponsored this SIG on, uh, SIG on vegetable and ornamental section. So let us see their video presentation for 15 seconds, and then we will start the session. All right, thank you very much, Isham Class, for sponsoring us this technical session. Okay, so next, I would like to invite our chair of a special interest group on vegetable and ornamental, Mr. Michel, to start sharing the session. Mr. Michel, please. Thank you, Dr. May, uh, and uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, virtual session on the of the SIG uh, group. My name is Michel de Varouar and I'm the chair of the SIG veg as uh, as announced. So I would like to start saying a few words about this 2020 year which has been a strange year. We are now almost a year in this pandemic crisis and many economies in the world are reeling from this. Hundreds of thousands of business have suffered heavy losses or are closing. Millions of jobs have been lost around the world. We are either confined in our homes or stuck in our own countries, unable to travel. While there is havoc around the world, we should be at least happy that the agricultural sector and the vegetable seed sector in particular has survived this crisis and has even thrived in this year. Some seed companies have had actually done extremely well by a combination of better than usual sales and reduced operating costs. Because yes, in these uncertain times, everyone was very careful in their cash spending and travel, which is a big part of our globalized seed sector has come to a complete stop. We cannot always explain these excellent sales of vegetable seed. Where does it came about? Where did, where did it come about? Was it that Everyone is confined at home and they are consuming more homemade cooked dishes. Are they consuming more vegetables in this way? Was it because many people who lost their job had and had a piece of land started growing vegetables for self-consumption or for sale? Or was it that again confined in their homes, people in the cities and the countryside started growing more vegetables in their tiny gardens or balconies? Everyone has a different story and interpretation about this. We were also expecting a cash crunch in the distribution channel, but that did not happen either. Farmers continue to buy seed and plant crops. I think the combination of all that and most probably combined with a good alignment of the stars, that means no adverse government policies, but rather conducive policies by the government to help the people in these difficult times, and overall clement weather has helped this. At the beginning of the pandemic in February, March, if you remember, there was uncertainty across all industries and the supply chains were completely stopped. Seed movement 
as a part of that was also halted. And you all know how much we are dependent on getting seed across borders. But we have to give credit to the government of the countries in the Asia Pacific region that very quickly they recognized agriculture as a priority industry. It was giving all the exemptions necessary to resume operations. And especially in government offices who have to clear our shipments and test our seeds to enter the country. This was absolutely critical to make sure that on top of a pandemic, we would also not have food shortages. So it took a few months to bring back the shipments all organized, but thanks to the very long term planning cycle our industry demands, buffer stocks helped keep the supply flowing. And by the time the situation was almost normalized, we could get our supplies back again. Now, almost one year on, and hopefully with the COVID vaccine in sight, our business has adapted to the situation. And some of you have started working differently, very differently even. Most of you are still working from home. Zoom, Teams, Meet have become new words in our vocabulary and we're using more and more these apps to communicate. Some of you have also considered shortening supply chain lines, producing seed closer to home. And I have seen sprouting, for example, very interesting development using new technologies and social media around remote field visit, for example, or virtual new varieties demonstration. I have seen the development of alternate distribution channels like e-commerce for seed taking more importance or seed production fields visit filmed by drone and shared online. All these are very interesting new, new developments. So we all said it, the world after COVID will not be the same and it starts showing. So how will you work differently in the future? We will see that in the coming years and it's promising to be very, very interesting and very exciting. So with these few words, I would like to uh, open this uh, virtual session and um, give the floor to our next uh, three presenters, which are going to be presented by my co-chair, Dr. Jan Chupeng. We will also have an update uh, of the WIC group by Dr. Sumitra, the exiting chair of this group, and very interesting work that is done in that group. Then I will be closing by giving you an update on our activities uh, this year. But last but not least, I come to the end of my term as chair of SIG VEG. Dr. Jan has still one year to go as a co-chair until the end of his tenure in the EST. So after this meeting, we will be electing among our SIG active members and our R&D advisory group, the new chair for the SIG VEG and ornamentals for the future. So with this, uh, Dr. Jan, I think we can move on to the next presentation and our technical presentation. Thank you. So, okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yan Shu Pang, co-chair of the Vegetable and Ornamental SIG group. Thank you for being us, with us today for this virtual session on vegetable and flowers. For the next one and a half hours, we will have speakers with us followed by question and answer session. The first uh, two presentations will be given by two speakers. They are Dr. Martin Zunerveld from the Netherlands and Dr. Benjamin Kilian from Germany. So I would like to introduce them a little bit. So Dr. Zunerveld is the gym back manager of the World Vegetable Center. He joined the World Vegetable Center in 2017 to oversee the center's gym bank operation and he has been working in this area since 2006. Today, he's going to talk about the conservation of vegetable biodiversity in South and South Asia. Dr. Kaden is a senior scientist, also the project manager in charge of the pre-breeding projects supported by the Global Shrub Diversity Trust. With his presentation, he will provide examples on how wild species can contribute to the development of improved crop varieties and where efforts must be focused in order to harness their value in the future. 
Now let us invite Dr. Martin for the presentation first. So Dr. Zunewald, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jan, for this introduction. Um, so um, um, from APSA, they will share the presentation. Thank you. Um, so thank you for this opportunity uh, uh, to be part of this session and to give a presentation, which is about conservation of vegetable biodiversity in South and Southeast Asia. Next, please. Um, so before we uh, go into more detail, I would like to share with you this map on the origins of vegetables around the world. So there are many pictures. Uh, uh, and if we focus uh, onto Asia, you will see that in Asia, um, there are several centers uh, of uh, diversity of vegetables, such as in East Asia of cabbages and kangkong, in South Asia, of gourds, okra, and eggplant and moringa, and also in Southeast Asia, uh, gourds, yarlong bean, and slippery cabbage. Um, this is just an introduction about the genetic resources that are uh, existing in the region, um, or still existing in the region. And for these crops, um, South, Southeast, and East Asia are the primary regions of diversity. In addition, uh, South and Southeast Asia is also a very interesting region of crop diversity of other crops that have been introduced maybe 500 years ago uh, after the discovery of the Americas. We know, of course, the wide diversity of chili peppers in South and Southeast and East Asia, as well as pumpkin diversity, to name a few examples. Um, with that, uh, let's go to the next slide. So, of course, there are many vegetables in, um, and if we want to have a look at um, the vegetables that are being conserved in gene banks in Asia, maybe we should have a look first, okay, uh, what are the most important vegetables uh, uh, for the region? So I, I, I checked uh, the FAO, uh, the World Food uh, uh, and Agriculture Organization, for the production statistics of the major vegetables produced in Asia. And you will see on the top onion, garlic, and other allium crops. You see how we, so allium genetic resources in general, and besides the number of uh, hectares times thousands in 2018 reported in Asia for this crop group. So onion, garlic, and other allium crops are, uh, have, to, have been most extensively cultivated in Asia and also tomato, peas, uh, cabbages and brassicas and eggplants, and the list goes on. So this, uh, what I would like to do in this presentation is to give an overview of the vegetable germplasm collections in South, the Southeast and East Asia, um, focusing on these crops and also traditional vegetables on which I will come later. Uh, then go into more detail about the World Vegetable Gene Bank, uh, because that's the gene bank that I know best. And then maybe very uh, shortly touched on the question, why do we need gene banks anyway? Uh, with, although I'm probably biased, um, with the focus on uh, germplasm conservation of cucurbits, including bitter gourd, pumpkin, luva, and cucumber. So um, if, we if we now have a look at um, the germplasm of the crops that have been reported in uh, FAO, as major crops um, produced in Asia. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, so here you see an overview of the top 10 gene banks that have reported uh, their uh, gene bank collections, uh, also to FEO, the World Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, so in this table, you see uh, the institute, the number of accessions that the institute holds and the country and the number of accessions of uh, those major vegetables, which are called here Faustal vegetables, uh, that were presented in the table of the previous slide. Um, so you see that in total in 2017, gene banks from Asia, with more precisely South, Southeast and East Asia, have reported more than 100,000 accessions and 
Most of these ex vegetable accessions are being maintained in the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources of India. Then comes the World Vegetable Center and then the NARO Gene Bank in Japan. And the list goes on. You can have a look here at the, at the, at the slide. Next, please. Yes. Um, so in addition to these major uh, to these major vegetables, there are many traditional Asian vegetables that you probably all know when you go to the market or you go to a restaurant, at least uh, coming from the Americas. I'm surprised about the amount of new vegetables that I'm seeing and tasting here in South, uh, in this region. So um, we have identified a 52 traditional uh, Asian vegetables as we, uh, as we would call them on the basis of three references, uh, which are stated here, a workshop that has been held already more than 20 years ago uh, by a previous gene bank manager of World Vegetable Center um, and two other references. Um, this list of traditional Asian vegetables includes some of the major vegetables that are being grown in the region, such as um, the, the cucurbits, as bitter gourd, cucumber, and lufa gourd but also many other vegetables that are not necessarily commercially interesting, but may be important for local food systems, for food security, and may also be interesting for developing new production system uh, adapted to climate change. And here's a small list of a, a few vegetables that we found uh, popping up in all the three references as being traditional Asian vegetables with a high potential, such as wax cord, Wing bean, uh, black nightshade, snake gourd, water drop gourd, slippery cabbage, and water leaf. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So these traditional A Asian vegetables, um, I so this, um, which is another category as the FAO stat vegetables. Um, because they, these traditional Asian vegetables also include less commercially uh, known uh, vegetables, uh, we can again look, okay, which of the Asian gene banks or the gene banks in South, Southeast and East Asia maintain large collections of these traditional Asian, Asian vegetables. And again, uh, the gene bank in India, uh, the World Vegetable Center gene bank and the gene bank in Japan uh, have the largest collections of these traditional Asian vegetables. And you See, the list goes down. There are also other gene banks in Bangladesh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Myanmar, Malaysia that have interesting collections. Next, please. And then if we add up the, 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 the two tables, uh, the germplasm accessions from the FAO stud, the FAO stud vegetables, and the traditional Asian vegetables, they overlap slightly because some traditional Asian vegetables were also part of the stop list, uh, you can see that, again, it, it, uh, it's not surprising that most gene bank accessions can be found in the Indian gene bank of the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, uh, our gene bank of the World Vegetable Center, which is here country Taiwan. But just to be clear, <laughs> to be clear this is an international collection. Uh, and then the Naro gene bank in Japan. And then the list goes down with other important collections in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Myanmar. Next, please. So uh, if we look at uh, the major crops that are being maintained in these gene banks, then we can actually see that soybean, which is considered a vegetable, for example, think of the vegetable soybean, um, has the largest collection across these uh, gene banks. Then comes capsicum peppers, including chili and sweet pepper, tomato, mustard, and cabbage. Uh, in this case, Brassica juncaea, then mung bean, um, eggplant, yardlong bean and cowpea, pea, bean and okra. So those are the, uh, are the, are the crops with major collections here in the region. And just uh, as a heads up, you probably miss already some uh, crops here on the list, such as the cucurbit. So where are they? We come back to that later. Next, please. Uh, there are also other important gene banks in South, South East and East Asia that did not report yet their information to uh, the World Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, so 
it means that for users from seed companies, public organizations, it's more difficult to uh, find out what kind of germplasm they have uh, in their collections and under which conditions they can make the germplasm available. Um, but still, they, they, um, he, well, they, some, they published through other ways. For example, this, this uh, gene bank in China, the national medium term gene bank for vegetable germplasm resources, has a very interesting vegetable collection. Uh, here you see a table with a list of the major vegetable crops that they maintain, uh, headed by kidney bean, common bean, fasciolus, uh, tomato, chili pepper, uh, or, and sweet pepper, radish, cowpea, and the list go, goes on. And then the other important gene bank that has not yet reported to the FAO, the World Food and Agriculture Organization, is the uh, gene bank in Korea, the National Agrobiodiversity Center of RDA. Um, thank you. Next. Um, so I just gave an overview about the, the major Ace, uh, gene banks in South, Southeast and East Asia. Let's now go into more detail of one of the largest gene banks in this region, which is the World Vegetable Center Gene Bank. Um, we have over 65,000 accessions. Uh, most of them, a large part of the collection consists of soybean. And then uh, another part where you see category name percentage is actually tomato. So we have, a, we have um, yeah, one of the biggest collections of tomato in the world and capsicum pepper, very important collection. And also of mung bean, we have a global key collection, eggplants, um, a global key collection. And then, yeah, the list goes on in total. I, uh, we have uh, germplasm of more than 450 species from originating from uh, 150 countries. Next, please. And here you see how over uh, the years we have distributed germplasm, a gene bank accessions, as well as uh, breeding lines to uh, users, uh, public institutions, uh, seed companies. Um, where you see in red, well, you, first of all, you, you don't see Taiwan, where we are based, because all the arrows uh, <laughs> uh, go from our gene bank to the other countries. And then the, the red lines, the dark red lines, are the lines um, to the countries where most germplasm has been requested. So, for instance, um, South Korea, uh, Thailand, India, Philippines, Taiwan, of, um, U, uh, the US, and also China, Japan, uh, have been the major requesters uh, of germplasm from uh, the World Vegetable Center. And we've um, uh, distributed that germplasm accordingly. So in the future, uh, we want to maintain, of course, our, um, we, we want to continue distribute to our partners and users in South and uh, Southeast and East Asia, but we also want to get more red and dark red lines uh, towards Africa. Um, so that also more and more research institutes uh, and seed companies in Africa will start using our germplasm. Um, because uh, in my, yeah, our mission is, uh, as a gene bank is conserve and enhance the use of the vegetable diversity that we maintain. Next, please. So if you want to know more about our collection, uh, you can go to uh, this um, website with uh, yeah, an, an acronym which is hardly pronounceable, AFGRIS, um, which stands for yeah, AVRDC's uh, Vegetable Genetic Resources Information System. So AVRDC is still our old name, so we are going to change this soon. But in the meantime, you can go to this website and find more information. Next, please. So here you can uh, look for base, basic information, uh, passport data, uh, which means we, uh, the species, um, the country of origin, distribution status, um, and, here, uh, and, um, uh, and then afterwards request a seed. Next, please. Um, and also our information is available on uh, the following uh, website, Genesis, which is um, a repository of gene bank data maintained by the Crop Trust, where 
gene banks from all around the world are uh, depositing their information to make users uh, to make it more easy for users to find the germ blessing that they need. Next, please. Um, and then once you have found a seed of your interest, you can request that um, through two ways. Um, either you go to the website, which is uh, uh, which, you, which you see here, or you can send an email to uh, the email direction, which is also on the slide, seed request at worldwitch.org. At this moment, our seed request system is still a bit, uh, yeah, how do you say that? Um, let me put it another way. We are, we are now working on uh, the improvement of our seed request sy uh, system. And for the meantime, please use this one. And if you have any problems uh, or any issues, uh, you can also write me. Next, please. Uh, for the distribution, we use for our gene bank accessions, the standard material transfer agreement. And for the improved lines, the breeding lines developed by the breeding groups of uh, the World Vegetable Center, uh, we use an MTA2. Uh, and well, in addition to that, uh, for sp special projects or special agreements, such as uh, in the APSA World Veg Breeding Consortium, there are special conditions to access and a distribution of the lines of our breeding groups. Next, please. Um, so why are gene banks still needed? Uh, um, well, one thing is that uh, more and more cropland raisins and wild varieties and wild relatives are being threatened to be lost forever. Well, that sounds a bit dramatic, but that is in fact the case. And um, a, a paper came out this year um, confirming the urgent need for global action to uh, continue to conserve uh, uh, land races and uh, wild varieties and relatives that are still in traditional farming systems or in um, uh, natural vegetation. And at the same time, in those areas where uh, no more land races exist, the gene banks are still very important because they're probably not the only place where uh, these land races and wild varieties and wild relatives are being maintained. Um, next, please. So as part of um, strengthening the conservation of vegetable genetic resources, and actually plant genetic resources in general, the, the crop trust um, is developing several strategies, global strategies for the conservation of uh, specific crops. Um, so in collaboration with the World Vegetable Center and with APSA, um, we, well, there has been the development of a global strategy for the conservation of cucurbit diversity. In the same way, the crop trust is collaborating with other organizations um, for, for example, the a global strategy for millets or the global strategy for, um, um, for forages. Um, but cucurbit, uh, vegetable germ plasm, that is of our interest, so I'm going to talk about that. And last year, uh, before the uh, COVID-90 uh, crisis, we were still uh, working uh, in a usual way, organizing a meeting and coming uh, together physically in a technical workshop uh, with uh, people from uh, different gene banks, other cucurbit specialists, and also representatives of APSA and uh, CIT, Rijkswaan, and East West City to uh, develop an, a strategy on, or to provide input to a strategy for the conservation of cucurbit diversity. Next, please. So why is it important to collect and safeguard cucurbits? First of all, to broaden the genetic basis for breeding and to provide users, uh, mostly seed companies in Asia, uh, new uh, sources for traits of interest. Uh, one example is the successful uh, Bittergort uh, breeding program of uh, Dr. Dylan, our lead cucurbit uh, breeder at World Veg, who has developed uh, new uh, what is it, uh, inbred lines to develop uh, hybrids um, uh, for uh, seed companies. And 
basically by using new sources of land races to broaden the genetic basis for breeding and to find new sources for traits of interest. Next, please. Um, the same um, is now being done for Lufa Gord. And here's a, also, here you see an, uh, two photos of the Lufa diversity that can be found in the gene bank of World Veg, and that is now also being used by Dr. Dylan uh, for screening. Next, please. And then also we've, we see that uh, cucurbits are being underrepresented in Asian gene banks. So if we uh, look at the top 10 of crops that are being maintained in Asian gene banks, then we don't see any cucurbit here. Next. Uh, and then finally, if we go look in the top 20 from uh, 11 to 20 of um, crops, the number of accessions that are being maintained in Asian gene banks, we see that on plate 13 and uh, 18 and 20, we see Lufa gourd, bitter gourd, cucumber, and also on plate 17, melon. But for example, still no uh, pumpkin. So that is so. There are several reasons to focus or to increase efforts on the conservation and uh, or safeguarding and collecting cucurbits. Next. Um, so here are three priority cucurbits in Asia, um, which, um, on, uh, which, well, in my view, might be important: uh, bitter gourd, lufa, pumpkin, uh, being Asia a secondary center of diversity for pumpkin, and also cucumber. Uh, next, please. Um, so very interestingly, since the the workshop uh, that was held to organize a global or to provide input to a global strategy uh, for uh, the conservation of cucurbit diversity. We have been in discussion with APSA, um, also thanks to the efforts of uh, Chai Ti, Chai Chia, um, and um, uh, to develop a proposal or discuss a proposal with APSA how we can establish a private public partnership to collect and safeguard cucurbit diversity in South and Southeast Asia. And during these discussions, we have identified two targeted countries, uh, which are important areas of diversity, Bangladesh and Myanmar, uh, which uh, could be targeted for the collection and safeguarding cucurbit diversity um, in collaboration with national gene banks. So that discussion is, under, is ongoing and uh, yeah, we will we we will uh, we look forward to to further discuss it with with APSA. Uh, next, please. Yeah. So thank you for this uh, for the uh, for your time, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Yes. Thank you, um, Martin. Maybe we will switch to the presentation of the next speaker and then combine the questions later. So I've already seen some questions. Uh, popping up in the Q&A box. So remember, if you have some questions, go down there and write your question. Uh, so we will now give the opportunity to Dr. Benjamin Killian for his presentation. So Dr. Killian, please. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Michel, and Dr. Jan, and Dr. May for your kind introduction and, of course, invitation. I would like to share my screen now. Do you see my big screen now, or which one? We, we see a part of a screen in a beautiful desert in the background, so maybe yeah. you need to... Yeah, now it's okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, it is with great pleasure that I give this presentation today. And um, it's also my pleasure to build on Dr. Martin's um, presentation here. Here you see the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction. And then I would like to introduce the Crop Wild Relative Initiative or project. And more specifically, I would like to focus on our eggplant pre-breeding and carrot pre-breeding activities 
And then in, at the end, there will be an outlook or future direction slide. So one slide about the Crop Trust. So the Crop Trust is an international organization working to support conservation, but also use of plant genetic resources. We are supporting national gene banks, international gene banks, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, but also, and more recently, pre-breeding activities around the world. So pre-breeding means um, using plant genetic resources. And the Crop Trust is recognized as an essential element of the funding strategy of the Plant Treaty. As you know, our climate is changing. And on this slide, you see the percentage loss of world cereal production by 2050. This is a model, of course. But you see all these brown areas where we will expect a loss. And but how, the good news is, however, there, is one, there, is, there are several ways to mitigate the impact. And one way, of course, is to develop improved, well-adapted varieties that are tolerant or resistant to these new ranges of, of abiotic and biotic um, challenges. And you also know that plant domestication and crop improvement, they have resulted in reduced genetic diversity. So our elite varieties today, they have less diversity than the land races here or the crop wild relatives. And this is indicated by these colored boxes. So improvement via crop breeding really requires a novel variance of genes. And this is indicated by these yellow um, alleles here. And so these crop wild relatives, but also the land races, of course, they are a potentially a valuable source of these um, variants or alleles. So the idea is to recapture lost beneficial genetic diversity. However, it's often very challenging to work with crop wild relatives. And here on this slide, you see a wild eggplant, Solanum sisimprifolium from the tertiary gene pool. pool. And it's, you can imagine it's very challenging to cross this wild eggplant with this um, Solanum melongena line here. And this, this process here is called or often um, referred to as pre-breeding. So pre-breeding refers to a wide range of activities designated first to identify um, beneficial characteristics in the wilds or in the land races. So first we have to identify these, these yellow alleles. If they are beneficial, that's great. And then we have to transfer these beneficial alleles into the elite um, gene pool. And also you can see this pre-breeding process or continuum as a bridge between gene banks that hold and safeguard the diversity, as Martin explained, and also the breeders and the farmers who use this diversity. So pre-breeding is really a long, at the moment, a long and laborious process. It's challenging and very costly. And whenever possible these days, until recently, pre-breeding efforts, they were largely avoided because they are so challenging and costly. But climate change now is forcing all of us to seek also useful trades from all available sources, including crop wild relatives. And this is illustrated here by carrots. You have a wild carrot here, and this wild carrot can be trout tolerant. And the idea is to transfer trout tolerant related traits into the domesticated carrots. So we really need long-term efforts and substantial investment in pre-breeding. And this is still rare. However, there's one unique global initiative to facilitate the use of crop wild relatives in breeding new improved crop varieties. And this is the crop wild relative project 
or more specifically also here, it's all about adapting agriculture to climate change, collecting, protecting and preparing crop wild relatives. This global initiative is supported by the Norwegian government. We have a budget of 50 million US dollars over 10 years. However, due to the crisis at the moment, we will go for one more year, no cost extension. And very briefly, we had four major components here in this um, initiative. There was a gap analysis and priority setting um, component. It's all about understanding what is which diversity, which part of diversity is already conserved in gene banks and in which regions and for what for which crops we have to collect more to safeguard these um, diversity. And then there's a collecting phase. I will have I will have I have slide two slides here for you in a second. And then there's this pre-breeding and evaluation component in the conservation part. It's already clear from this slide that within 10 years, you cannot just wait and first collect and then go for, for pre-breeding. No, you, we had to run these components in parallel. Yeah. This is also here, this slide helps to connect my presentation to Martin's talk. I would like to tell you that this group, this CWR project was a true global collecting effort. We, we collected in 25 countries. And in Asia, for instance, we collected in Pakistan, in, in Nepal, in Vietnam, or in, in Malaysia. And we also um, published a global rescue um, brochure. You can download it from our website. And during six years, our partners collected in 25 countries and they collected, it's a bit small here, I'm sorry for this, more than 4,600 new samples of crop wild relatives and they belong to approximately 370 taxa. Now I would like to focus on the pre-breeding component and we are supporting 19 crops or 19 pre-breeding partnerships. We have one forage crop here. We have cereals on board like barley or, or, or even durum wheat. We have vegetables, carrot and eggplant, but also legumes. However, our idea was to focus on climate change related traits. And these are mostly um, heat, trout or salinity um, tolerance related traits and to a less extent also um, pests and diseases. And here on this slide, on this slide you, you get a feeling about our partnerships. We worked with more than 100 partners in 50 countries on 19 crops. And here in, in, in East Asia, for instance, we have good partners in, in Taiwan here, the World Vegetable Center, but also in the Mekong Delta. We have, we are working with seed clubs there or Inner Mongolia on Alpha Alpha, in, this is China. So the focus is on developing countries and we had a broad range, range of um, partners, including universities, but also NGOs, farmers, associations and also the private sector is on board. Now I would like to highlight a few of our activities. One key activity, for instance, is our participatory evaluation component with farmers. And on this slide, you see that we are working with farmers in Morocco, for instance. And these farmers, they are evaluating, they are growing in their own fields on farm crop wild relative derived lines of durum wheat or barley and lentil. And from their feedback, um, it's already clear that they appreciate the yields and the quality of these crop wild relative derived lines. And they are so often superior than all available commercial varieties at the moment. 
So what is important here, we are working on farm and this helps us also that farmers um, adopt these newly um, developed crop wild relative derived lines. We consider the preferred traits of the farmers. And also we are making sure that farmers really have access to crop wild relative derived varieties. This was not the case in the past. Then capacity building is key for us. And this is a summary slide here as of December last year. So we, we had trainees in yeah, 44 countries, more than 8,000 um, people were trained. And also this is, we are proud of this. We have more than 50 master and PhD students in the project, just the pre-breeding component here. So again, capacity building is key and we are focusing on developing countries. And one example is on this slide. Um, this is on, on carrots in Bangladesh. And farmers in, in Bangladesh, they are learning how to grow carrots and even to produce seeds of these carrots. And carrot is, is a relatively new crop for Bangladesh or even for Southeast Asia. A carrot is on the way to become really a subtropical crop, if you wish. So at least we see um, great progress there with our partnerships. Conservation and access to um, pre-breeding lines is important. We are supporting here um, the multilateral system. We are in full support. And I would like to tell you that our most promising and best pre-breeding lines, they, are, they will be conserved in gene banks and also made available under the standard material transfer agreement conditions. So you can request seeds. And here on this slide, there's an issue, you know, sometimes a challenge to really provide relevant pre-breeding data to different stakeholders. And this is challenging. And fortunately, we are working with the James Hutton Institute in Scotland to create databases. They are called Germinate databases. And each pre-breeding project will get a Germinate database that doesn't already have a database solution. And so this, these ger Germinate databases, they are free, open access, and really powerful data storage, data visualization, and, and data sharing solution. One example is, is shown here on this next slide. This is a screenshot of the landing page for the Germinate eggplant database. And on this, um, yeah, image here, this is, you see a greenhouse for, uh, with, with um, introgression lines in Spain. And you can navigate, you can yeah, click on this link later, you can navigate through, you will get access to all kind of genotypic, phenotypic data. You have, will find the passport data and so on. Now I would like to um, dive with you a little bit into this, into this eggplant pre-breeding partnership. It's all about introgression breeding for adaptation to climate change. And you see here, our lead partner for this pre-breeding partnership is, is Jaime Prohens from Valencia in Spain. And we are working with partners from the Ivory, Ivory Coast, Sri Lanka and the World Vegetable Center. And this was a really an excellent partnership. And we are proud also to, because we had um, the private sector on, on board and especially East West Seed um, helped us in evaluating the most yeah, promising eggplant lines. So back in 2013, early 2014, our eggplant partners, they did the first crosses between six um, Solano Melongena varieties selected from Ivory Coast and Sri Lanka. And they crossed these six 
um, with 14 wild species um, of eggplants from all three different gene pools. And, they, and it took several years. And in this slide, you see the main recent germplasm outputs. So it was really a, a unique systematic introgression marathon, if you wish, with 20, 30, 40,000 crosses, even more. And now we have genome fragments of wild eggplants in Solano melongena background. And most advanced are 16 backcross populations derived from seven wild eggplant species from all gene pools. And the wild species, but also the interspecific hybrids or the advanced backcross lines, they were all acronomically characterized and screened against diseases and, and pests and stresses. And on this slide, you see some examples of tolerances and resistances identified. For instance, some wild accessions, but also some hybrids and even one um, parental line here was, was found to be um, resistant against bacterial wilt. Other samples are resistant against spider mites or white flies or, or some fungi. But in a kind of summary, all these resistant um, samples, resistant to soil-borne diseases and pests, they are excellent candidates um, as rootstocks for crafting. And this is in progress already. And some accessions or samples or hybrids, they were also found to be um, trout stress tolerant and, and had some good yields under really severe, severe water stress conditions, but these um, experiments are still ongoing. On this slide, you see the main conclusions from the, from the eggplant rebreeding projects. And basically, these new population with introgressions from crop wild relatives, they can easily, really easily be incorporated into um, breeders' pipelines, and can, they can even be used directly by farmers. And these yeah, pre-breeding materials tolerant to drought, stress, and others, yeah, some are really tolerant to drought stress, and others are really suitable for as rootstocks. Maybe two or three slides briefly about the veg another uh, vegetable crop about carrot here, because also this is a fascinating um, pre-breeding project. Our lead partner is Phil Simon from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in the United States, and we are working here with good partners in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, but also through the World Vegetable Center in Taiwan and, and northern India. And Phil Simon and partners, they put together a very diverse panel of crop wild relative lines and land races. And they were evaluated under heat stress, drought stress, but also salinity stress um, field trials conditions in Pakistan and Bangladesh. And fortunately, five to 10% of these entries, they were really superior compared to current commercial um, varieties in regard to the trout stress, heat tolerant and, and salinity tolerance. One last main conclusion slide from the carrot pre-breeding project. We saw a wide range of abiotic stress responses among crop wild relatives and land races. Um, our partners identified new sources of heat, trout, and salinity tolerance for crop improvement. And also what is really great, these stress tolerant um, lines, they already produce seeds. And Phil Simon and, and all his partners, they in, initiated um, the development of breeding pools. If you would like to learn more about the carrot pre-breeding project or the eggplant project, um, I have a good news for you. There will be a special edition in January next year in 2021. 
about um, adapting agriculture to climate change. And you will find 19 papers on certain crops from our pre-breeding partners, including this one from Phil Simon and team about the wild carrots. This is my last um, slide here. So in summary, we, we really saw and still see impressive progress in introgressing beneficial traits from crop wild relatives. And we identified crop wild relative derived lines that are really promising. And this really justifies all the expenses and effort of such a, an initiative. We are working hard to get a continuation project funded to further support um, the pre-breeding partnerships, because our yeah, final aim is that we see practical outcomes in farmers' fields. And we are convinced that new omics technologies, they have significant potential for not just identify beneficial genetic diversity, but also move um, more efficiently these genes from crop wild relatives into the elite germplasm. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. And uh, thank you to both speakers for uh, keeping the time. Now we have uh, some time for some questions that have been posted there. Now, um, there is one question addressed to Martin and I think two questions addressed to Benjamin. Uh, Martin, can you click on the Q&A session and see the first yes. question addressed to you? Maybe you can say that you will reply it live. Answer, Answer live. live. Okay. Maybe I, I suspect it will show the, the question on screen. And if not, maybe you can repeat the question before answering. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michel. Um, so yes, biodiversity is a threat but have you been able to identify, collect new wild species eventually? Uh, thank you for that great question. And I think the presentation of Benjamin basically responds that question, but not completely. Um, I think for me, the, the crop route re uh, relative uh, project is really a great example of how to, through collaboration, uh, we can uh, collect and safeguard and use germplasm. And ben, uh, Benjamin gave two very nice examples of, of vegetables, but these are only two vegetables. I think what we have to discuss as a community on vegetables and, well, this is vegetables and ornamentals, but on vegetables, how, what can we learn from this uh, crop rod relative project uh, to also collect, safeguard and use the wild uh, germ, uh, germplasm of vegetables, including cucurbits, uh, including uh, uh, chili pepper, uh, including other vegetable species. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but, but for that, we need to uh, collaborate between public institutions, but also to establish public and private partnerships. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Martin. So I think we can switch to Benjamin, if you can click on the Q&A and uh, yeah. just to maybe read the question, actually answer live does not help in this case. So Thank just you. repeat the question and answer the two questions that were addressed to you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the first question is, is about Morocco. Um, how do you test the crop wild relative lines in Morocco to evaluate the yield? Is it under in ex extensive or intensive crop management systems? Well, um, first we, we had some on station trials. So they were really um, maybe intensive um, crop management systems. But, but since last year, we are working with 20 farmers on farm. So they, we are using their on farm um, practices, right? And in some in some areas, they are more extensive and others, they are more intensive. And I hope this is sufficient at the moment. If not, I can bring the 
yeah, bring you in, in contact and connect you with, with our partners in Morocco. So there's a wide range of um, management systems there. And we would like to expand this in the near future. So, and we are in different parts of Morocco in the, in the high plateaus, but also in the more in the Western part in the really trout grown areas. And then the second question here, which species of eggplant did you use for bridging crosses for secondary and tertiary gene pools? This is also a good question. As far as I'm, I'm aware, no bridging species was needed. Our partners, they were able to do these crosses directly. So they crossed the Melongena, so different Melongena lines with, with wild species from all three gene pools. But of course, they had to develop new methodologies and strategies. Sometimes embryo rescue, I think, was needed. Sometimes new culture media um, had to be developed. But also, I can provide more information later. I hope this answered your question. Yeah, then there is a question on the Nagoya protocol by uh, Anke. I think that's a wide question addressed to both. Uh, I hope you can answer that um, in, a, in a few words, if you can. The topic is wide. Uh, Martin, maybe you uh, on the Nagoya protocol influence on your work and okay. how does that? Um, yes, thank you, sorry. Yes, uh, it basically means more work. Um, so, so again, I, I, this crop route relative project is very interesting because in my view, uh, where we also participate in, in receiving uh, wild material of eggplant. And by working together, uh, we can create uh, synergies and work more efficiently together uh, because as a national gym as a gym link alone it's very difficult to uh, to meet all the requirements uh, it takes a lot of time so collaboration again is i think key here to address the nagoya protocol yeah benjamin a word on this also from your side crop trust how is uh, because collecting samples in uh, in countries uh, yeah, like Bangladesh or Myanmar, that would be for Martin, is, is not easy, of course. And this, I, I fully um, agree with what Martin said. Maybe a little bit on, more on collecting, it was really challenging, you know, for all of us to get these collecting permits, right? And sometimes it took three, four, five years to get these collecting permits. But we are proud what our partners have achieved, but it's also, I agree with Martin that more collecting is needed in the future. We, we have not closed all collecting gaps. And then so many crop wild relative population and land raises, they, they, they disappear really. And we have to safeguard them. Yeah, so there is urgency there. Now a very last question uh, to Benjamin uh, regarding whether Crop Trust is open to take any pre-breeding collaborative projects for other vegetable seed species. And that was actually going to be one of my questions. Out of the 19 that you shown, most of them are field crops. And yeah. two, the two only vegetables are carrot and eggplant. So why these two also? And uh, indeed, is it open to work on more, cro more vegetable crops? Right, right. You know, we selected, we had to select we had a certain budget for the pre-breeding component. Also the pre-breeding was new for the crop trust at that time. And we tried to select, yeah, from a wide range we selected, anyway, it's a long story, but <laughs> it depends on funding, right? And mm -hmm. also it depends on which country you would like to work. Our focus was on developing countries and also in the future, we would like to strengthen our pre-breeding partnerships, of course. And we would like to work on more vegetables. You know, there are so many fantastic opportunities on African um, leafy vegetables and others, right? And, but it depends on the, on the budget also. But if you have ideas, just write to me and then we will find, do our best to collaborate. Yeah. 
Okay, the very last one, did you not only on Annex 1 crop? That's Yes, uh, Anke, this is right. At that time, we selected only among un uh, Annex 1 crops. Therefore, there is no tomato, for instance. And, you know, yeah. in the future, I think the first priority is to build on these already existing pre-breeding partnerships and to advance our best CWR derived materials. And the second priority will be to, to connect national gene banks with farmers and breeders in the future. And, but we have to think about which crops. I hope you could hear me, it's, it's, it's frozen somehow. Yes, we can hear you, Benjamin. Thank you. I think it's uh, from Michelle's side. All right. Thank you very much. Also, thanks, Michelle, for sharing this uh, great um, sharing this section of the, the gene bank presented by Martin and, and Dr. Benjamin. So next, I would like to invite back uh, Dr. Yan to introduce our next presenter. OK, so let, let us move on to the next presentation. So it is a great pleasure of mine to introduce the next speaker, Ms. Meryl Langens. She's from the Netherlands. She has been working in the city industry for more than 15 years. Uh, I, I, I will open the uh, camera. Now she works as the global manager of the industry affairs for bus variable seas and she is the chair of the ISF system approach working group. Today, she's going to discuss with us the system approach, an alternative option for phytosanitary certification, which really matters a lot to see treat. So let us welcome Ms. Meryl Langens for her presentation. So Meryl, welcome. Hello, Dr. Jan. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, to, to get this opportunity. Thank you for that opportunity to talk today to the audience about systems approach. And I will now share my screen. Let me see. Yes, so I hope you can see the screen. Okay, I assume that- that's Yes, we can. Sure. Yeah, okay. Okay, so good morning, everybody. As I said, Dr. Jan said, I will give you an update today about what is going on in the ISF working group on systems approach. And I will start with two slides just to set the scheme, to set the stage of why we work on this topic. And here in this slide, you see, this is all common knowledge for everyone, that for import and export of seed, a phytosanitary certificate is needed. And this certificate is issued by the country of export, and you have to fulfill the requirements of all the countries to which you want to export your seeds. And you see here on the right hand side that uh, the countries where you import your seeds to, they can have uh, well, all kinds of requirements that have to be fulfilled. These are called the additional declarations, and the list of additional declarations can be quite long. Okay, then an additional challenge for import and export of seeds is um, re-export. And in this picture, you see uh, that uh, the idea is to move seed from country A to B and then to C. And you see the requirements in country B are just for one pest and they require a field inspection. But in country C, there are requirements for uh, four pests. And instead of a field inspection for pest number five, a very specific seed health test is required and the method is uh, prescribed. So that means that when you produce the seeds in country A, you have already to know where will the seed lot in the end go to and you have to fulfill the requirements of all the different countries. And the hurdle is that not all these requirements are, uh, are harmonized. They are about different pests and they are about different measures. So that makes it quite challenging to move seed around the world. 
And here you see a short summary of, yeah, basically of the challenges in seed trade, the certification, each seed lot has to be certified. Um, what you also see, what wasn't shown in the, in the slide yet, is that the, the number of pest requirements is increasing, it's increasing rapidly. And also this requirements that country have for the import of, uh, of seeds can change quickly. For example, we have seen that for the tomato brown rugose fruit virus, um, where there's an emergency measure in Europe and the implementation time is three days. So there can be very quick changes and that makes it very difficult to yeah, proactively address those changes. Um, also, not all requirements are for pests that are actually associated with seeds as a pathway. You know, it's, it's quite likely quite often. Well, in fact, if you look at all this, the, the pests that are regulated worldwide, um, about 80% of those pests are, um, for, uh, are, are not really pests that are seed transmitted or they are not pests that are relevant for the specific crop. So there's a huge, yeah, that, that makes it again, uh, challenging. The re-export that I showed, and then also the, the moving of small seed lot for research where there's often not enough seed to do a full blown seed health test and yeah, how to deal with that. So all these hurdles and you know, with, with this increasing complexity all around the world, um, we were thinking how, you know, how could we simplify that? How could we make that easier? And the possible solution that we came up with in the working group is what we call systems approach. And systems approach is the big difference with the current system is that uh, in systems approach, it's not so much about certification of each and every seed lot, but it's more about certification of companies. And this certification is then accepted by uh, all the countries, well, uh, th th that accept it basically. And the idea is that as many countries as possible um, should accept the system. So we would like to have a multilateral, multilateral uh, system. And the idea is that once you are certified as, your, as a company, once your practices, uh, the way you work are certified and uh, that your seeds can move easily between the countries that accept systems approach and that accept the certification. How it could look practically is, uh, is drawn here. It could, we still think that there will be phytosanitary certificates needed. I mean, that's, um, um, that will be needed. Um, but the additional declarations will not be needed anymore. There will just be one statement as an example here, the CTOT is produced under systems approach. So all the requirements of all the different countries are covered by the certification of the company. Um, we don't want to um, uh, implement this as, an, uh, uh, as a replacement of the current system, but we think it could be an alternative option to, yeah, to simplify the movement of seed. So for those companies or, you know, who want to use the current system, that still remains possible. Okay, here very short, what, what's our purpose, what's our ambition? Well, like I explained, we hope to simplify, to harmonize the current system, to ship seed internationally. And we also um, have the ambition to coordinate between systems approach initiatives that are in development around the world. Because in different places of the world, um, yeah, this idea about systems approach is, is in development. People have, uh, have, embraced, have embraced it, uh, the ideas. And um, yeah, we think it, it's very important that we will end up with, yeah, with one system as much as possible and not with different systems approaches in different areas, in different regions. Because if you have to get certified for all these different systems approaches yeah, that, that may be developed in different regions, then our life may become even more complicated than it is today. So harmonization, alignment and globalization are very, uh, are very important keywords. Okay, now let's let's zoom in a bit more. Like like what? How does it look like? Systems approach. Um, here you see some of the essential elements from from an industry point of view. Um, we want to work in line with the international standards that are made by IPPC, the International Plant Protection Convention. They make the phytosanitary standards, and yeah, we think that is a, a perfect framework 
for uh, to make global agreements about movement of seed. So we think it's very important to work in line with those ISPMs. It's an alternative, global harmonization. Um, what's also very important, we think the system should be risk-based and data-driven, so based on solid scientific research and, and based on data that leads to the right decisions about the requirements, the import requirements. It should be accessible to small and large seed companies. So everybody, you know, it, it's not, not a competitive system. It's really something yeah, for the bigger goods, let's say. Um, it should accommodate, accommodate the, the needs of the different crops. So there should be a certain flexibility. And we also think that the current industry practices uh, would be a very nice basis uh, building block of a systems approach. Because currently, uh, companies already do a lot. They, they implement a lot of hygiene practices. And um, yeah, we think if those practices could be recognized in this certification system, then yeah, that, that, would be, uh, that would be very nice. We think that could work very well. Okay, some advantages. There's also, of course, some disadvantages. A big advantage is uh, that we think this is a long-term solution. Because right now, if there's import-export problems, um, yeah, those are solved in consultation between two countries, crop by crop, uh, basically ad hoc solutions. And with systems approach, we hope to set up a long-term solution. Um, we also think that the predictability of systems approach and the efficiency will, uh, yeah, will be big advantages. Um, because even if it is complicated, complicated what you have to do, um, if you know yeah, what it is, you can work towards it and you can make it happen. We also think it will uh, reduce the workload of MPPOs because they don't have to be involved anymore in this seed lot by seed lot certification and, 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 and testing, but they will get a different role in yeah, the ones overseeing the system and looking at, at the audits. And uh, yeah, I'll, I will come, uh, I'll tell a bit more about how the system looks, works in, in the next slides. And so you will understand how the workload of MPPOs will be reduced. We also think the system will proactively address issues with emerging pathogens. You can imagine if you have set up a system that works to prevent the entrance of a certain uh, bacterium, that this system also has potential to mitigate the risks for other bacteria that have the same pathway of entry. So that would reduce the need for emergency measures. On the downside, uh, systems approach may be more complex than, than the current endpoint testing or treatment because each participant has to set up a quality management system. There will be audits, a description of the processes. And yeah, so that takes time and, and investments. Um, another thing that is uh, challenging is that we're striving to a multilateral system, global harmonization, but the way the IPPC works is with bilateral agreements. So it will be very difficult to, um, yeah, to make a, a, a multilateral system via bilateral agreements. Um, another challenge is, um, well, we foresee a system where maybe it starts with a small number of countries and step by step, more countries will join the system. Um, if a country joins the system, probably you have to fulfill the requirements of the new and the old system at the same time, because you know the new country wants to check if, yeah, if the new system works. If this adding of new countries takes a long time and, and takes you know, like, like 10 or 20 years, it means that the participants will have to fulfill double requirements for a very long time. And that will not be an, uh, yeah, an incentive to, to join the system. Well, costs, yeah, like I say, you, you need to set up the system, quality management system, the certification, the audits. And since we're bound to these bilateral agreements, there will be a need for MPPOs to, to negotiate with each other, which is also costing time and money. But overall, we think the yeah, the, the advantages are bigger than the disadvantages. Okay, how did we approach this so far? So as I said, we, we want to work in line with international agreements with the IPPC. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's a perfect framework to make global agreements. So if we want to set up something that is globally accepted, support of IPPC is essential. And um, well, to, to uh, set that up, 
um, the NAPO, the North American Plant Protection Organization, has submitted a proposal to IPPC. And this proposal is about an annex to ISPM 38. ISPM 38 is the international standard on uh, the international movement of seed. And in this annex, it could be described how systems approach, a systems approach can be implemented. And NAPO uh, submitted this proposal yeah, after meetings we had between industry and uh, experts from different MPPOs and discussed these ideas of systems approach. Well, the proposed title of the annex is uh, design and use of systems approaches for phytosanitary certification of seeds and this proposal was given high priority by the commission on phytosanitary measures the cpm which is the governing body of the ippc and then the rest of the process uh, is currently yeah, is moving um, it will result in the setting up of an uh, expert working group of IPPC, like five, six, seven people that will work on this annex um, in which it is described how systems approach can be implemented. And as ISF, yeah, of course, ISF would like to have a seat in this group. This is, uh, this is what also happened in the preparation of ISPM 38. Um, ISF also had a seat in that, in that group. So we hope that that will be possible in uh, this next expert working group as well. This is um, yeah, a scheme of how the IPPC uh, process works. Here on the right hand side in green, you can see the steps that were already taken. And in black are the steps that still have to be taken place. Um, well, I think the good news is that uh, another step, so the, the standards committee in IPPC has now approved the specification. Specification is basically the, the final project proposal. And um, yeah, so it is foreseen that this expert working group will actually start working next year, second half of next year. So that is that is great news. And then, yeah, in the end, you see there's there's still some quite, uh, some steps. First, they develop a draft of the annex. Then there's a round of country consultation. Maybe there's another round of country consultation. So it will take, you know, this is a process that will take uh, years and not, not months. And also keep in mind that once the standard is developed, this annex is developed, that, uh, yeah, then the implementation of it worldwide will also take uh, yeah, several years. Okay, how did, yeah, so, so one part of the approach is uh, be in line with IPPC, collaborate with IPPC. And another important point is uh, to start small and work from success. We thought let, let's start the discussions of these ideas with, um, with a small number of countries that are uh, important in, uh, in the seed business. And um, so we had discussions, uh, organized workshops with experts from Australia, Chile, Netherlands, Mexico, US and South Africa. And these experts, they, uh, yeah, they were enthusiastic about the idea. And they requested that we would uh, describe our ideas in further detail um, so, so that they could use that as a starting point of uh, further discussions. Well, that's what we have done. We have written, uh, it's called an industry brief. And you see it here, it's, uh, it's about systems approach, an alternative option for phytosanitary certification. This document is now is available from ISF for all ISF members. And it is meant for, yeah, for internal discussions between companies, between seed association, associations to, yeah, to, to, to get a, a broad understanding of what it is that we mean and um, yeah, to, to start working on, uh, on the implementation and supporting the making of the annex. Okay, so that's the industry brief. Um, yeah, and now I will go into a bit more detail about what, yeah, about these elements of systems approach to make it a bit more concrete. Um, two important elements are a quality management system and auditing. Well, quality management system is, uh, yeah, it's probably nothing new. Um, it, it's the system, it's, it's the framework in which a company describes the goals, the aspirations, the policies. Um, it's also a description of what are the processes used uh, during seed production, during seed conditioning, seed testing, and yeah, how uh, it, it's basically a description of the, the relevant pest management practices. And audits are needed to verify if the company works according to what is described in the quality management system, internal audits, external audits. 
and audits are also needed to uh, confirm the efficacy of the system. Does it actually work, all these practices that the company uses, to keep the pests out of the seed productions? And these are, you know, these are elements that are present in any quality management system. Um, then what are the pests that are in scope? Because you know, all the different countries have different requirements. Not, not all the pests are relevant for each and every country, depending on the climate, uh, yeah, mostly, mostly depending on the climate and whether a pest occurs in a specific country. Um, we foresee that, that basically all the pests that are regulated at the moment, with a specific focus on the pests where seed is a pathway, that those are the pests that are in scope. So if you are if you are certified for systems approach, basically it means that all these regulated pests are the, the risks of entry of those pests are mitigated. A problem there is that um, there's no globally accepted list of the relevant seed transmitted pests. That would be you know that would be great if we have had such a list. So from from industry, uh, yeah, we propose. Um, to use the ISF regulated pest list as a basis, because that is a list, list that has been developed um, by ISF. It's an overview of all the pests that are regulated worldwide. And it's also an analysis. Is it actually, uh, is the crop a host for the pest? Is the pest seed borne? Uh, is it seed transmitted? Uh, it gives references. And uh, yeah, in our opinion, this could be a good basis for, um, uh, yeah, to, to to make this list of which pests are relevant. Um, once there's agreement about the pests that are relevant, you can make an analysis of how do these pests actually enter the seed production? Because there are, yeah, and, and this is very different, these ways of entry uh, can depend on the climate, it depends on the presence of the pests, the culture system, whether you grow pests in the protected uh, crops, indoor or, or in the open field has of course, uh, consequences for pests entering the seed production. Um, but if all these pathways are analyzed, does it enter via water, via mechanical spread, via insects? You, you can make an analysis of that per pest. And this can be used as a basis to describe the pest management practices that are needed to prevent entry of those pests. Okay, then um, in the end, it's, it's essential for a systems approach that the, the pest management practices that are applied in a specific country, that those practices are also accepted by other MPPOs, by multiple MPPOs, preferably by all MPPOs in the world. Um, like I said before, um, in IPPC, the way of working is based on bilateral agreements. And um, yeah, what what we have in mind that if you make those bilateral agreements as much as harmonized uh, as possible, in the end, you will end up with a more or less multilateral system. This also means that the description of your pest management practices in, in a specific area, in a specific company, may have to be rather detailed because there will only be global acceptance by all these different MPPOs if it's very clear what it is, the practices. Um, and, and at, well, at the same time, the, the description has to be uh, clear, transparent, and, and precise. But at the same time, some flexibility is needed because you, you want to keep room to, uh, you know, to implement innovations. If new things have been uh, come up, yeah, you want to be able to implement that in your practices. So um, we foresee that um, a, a crop appendix to the annex, so there will be a, uh, an annex and then crop appendices. And in this crop appendix, per crop, there will be an, an analysis of the pathway, how pests enter the seed production, and also a list of recognized pest management options. And we foresee that this is um, a list of minimum requirements. And yeah, how the, the company deals with that, how they are implemented is described in the quality management system. Of course, a company is always free to decide and implement uh, about more options. Um, and we also think that the development of these crop appendages that may, uh, yeah, that may take some time. It, it's not likely that they will all be ready. Uh, uh, it's maybe step by step. Yeah, this is, uh, this is then um, a picture of how, yeah, how the structure of the ISPM with the annexes may look. You see here the ISPM, then 
in the middle, the annex. In the annex, there will be the, yeah, the high level descriptions of how to make a quality management system, um, how do you produce, how do you uh, report new pests, emerging pests? I will come back to that uh, in, in the next slide. What are the, the options of the pest management uh, uh, risk options? How do you do a pathway analysis? How do we update these crop appendices? And how is the audits and certifications? How is that set up? And then in the crop appendices, well, there it's, it's specific per crop, the pathway analysis and the list of recognized pest management options, the minimum requirements. Okay. Then uh, two more topics. Um, one is pest reporting. In our discussions that we have with uh, representatives from NPPOs, um, it's very clear that what, uh, what should be a part of systems approach is increased transparency of the seed industry. The NPPOs have, yeah, have indicated that they would really appreciate to, to, yeah, to know earlier what, what it is that seed uh, companies uh, see in the field. What what pests do you see? What is out of the ordinary? Um, to keep that, you know, to, to be able to use that for the, the right regulatory uh, measures. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's clear. On the other hand, you know, one should also keep for companies, there's, yeah, it, it's not always easy to report everything, regulate um, when, yeah, when, when the interpretation of these uh, notifications or, or this reporting um, is used. So there should be a clear process described in the annex that, that clarifies how seed sector and NPPO uh, collaborate on defining the response measures to those report, reports. Um, one proposal we have to, to start setting up these conversations, because basically this is about building trust between MPPOs and between MPPOs and, and companies. And we think a very good step would be um, yeah, to find a way to have, let's say, annual communications between MPPOs and industry. And the basis for those communications could be an annual survey set up by the national seed associations. And they would then collect information about seed health related issues. In a very general way, like, like, you know, what are the phytosanitary issues you encountered that are out of the ordinary, more than usual, different than, than in other years. Uh, so it's not necessarily uh, the new ones, um, but yeah, can be anything. Um, participants to systems approach would be mandatory for them to participate in the survey. Um, the, the, the information would be consolidated and then uh, yeah, can be discussed between the relevant MPPOs and the seed companies. In the end, you could think about also uh, consolidating the information on an international level, possibly by the ISF secretariat, and that could then you know, be used internally by the industry because the MPPOs already have structures in place how to you know, report to each other and how to communicate to each other within IPPC. So that's an idea how to, yeah, to build trust and start the communication between or increase the communication between MPPOs and seed companies. Finally, um, we would like to, so, so we've now described our ideas and they're becoming more and more concrete. And we would like to, to work out with a small number of countries whether we can yeah, agree with this small group on, uh, yeah, on, on these ideas of systems approach. Can we agree uh, on, on paper? Um, yeah, on the processes and procedures, how systems approach uh, would work. Um, the outcome of that pilot, we would like to use as support for the IPPC working group, because if we can show that with four countries, you can come to an agreement, well, that's an indication that multilateral acceptance may be possible via bilateral agreements. Um, we're selecting countries that represent seed production, processing and sales so that you can do the process of export and re-export, what is very important for, for seeds. Um, we want to work with experts from MPPOs. Uh, we decided to use cucumber as a model crop. Um, we'll describe industry aligned pest management practices and want to use those as a starting point. First step is agree about the process in theory and then we may undertake actual seed shipments under the agreed process. Um, we're thinking about working with four countries and the organization of that is currently in progress. 
And I think that is my last slide. Yes. And in the back here is the participants in the systems approach working group. You see there's members from the industry and there's members from national seat associations and regional seat associations that are uh, yeah, member as well. Thank you very much, uh, Meryl, for this exhaustive uh, presentation. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A box. I don't see any question, which means that either your presentation was very clear, but um, I, I, I have a question uh, that maybe I can ask. I, I think I heard that you were going to start uh, soon with a crop in a country uh, or in two countries. So has, has this test already started or is it about to start or where, where is it in the actual implementation? No, it, it has not started yet. We are approaching the countries, um, whether they're interested and whether they, you know, think about the, yeah, the participant, the actual NPPO participant to this, uh, to this initiative. Yeah. yeah. Which, which two countries yeah. and crop has been chosen for that? Can you share um, that? Yeah, so, so we go, yeah, we chose cucumber. Um, yeah, I can, I can share the, the countries, uh, although they have not uh, all confirmed yet. Um, uh, USA, Chile. Australia and the Netherlands are what we're thinking about. Okay, okay, great. So, and that should start. Uh, when when do you think? Uh, yeah, hopefully. Might... Well, it it would have been very nice to start early next year um, in the country of production. You know, to have a yeah. workshop where you all can come together and talk about the crops and look at the procedures and look at the processes. But uh, yeah, we'll have to do it uh, virtually, but we hope uh, uh, the first half of, uh, of next year. Okay. Okay. Thank you again for this uh, good presentation. I'm checking again, it's still, still empty. So I think we are now have five minutes a break um, and we will be back in exactly five minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.